Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, Boschko is going to be talking on the cohomology of vertex algebras and Poisson vertex algebras. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm glad to see all friends, even in virtual. <laughs> uh, this is based on uh, joint work with Alberto de Sove, Victor Katz, Mimudo Tilani, and uh, Veronica Vignoli. Uh, we actually have six papers already. Uh, some of them are by subset of authors. But, uh, uh, I'm going to give you just the big picture, like uh, explain the main ideas because uh, it's hard to cover everything. You know, these are hundreds of pages long already. Uh, now, I don't think I'll be able to see the chat. So if you have questions at any time, please feel free just to jump in and speak up. Uh, I'll be glad to answer questions during the talk. Uh, so I'll try to use the board and I'll also show some stuff on the screen sometimes. So, so let's start with the big picture with uh, these notions that are mentioned in the title. Vertex algebras, I hope everyone knows what the vertex algebra is at this seminar. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, and uh, many vertex algebras are constructed uh, from infinite dimensional Lie algebras, uh, like uh, fine cuts Moody algebras or the Virasora algebra. Uh, or you can say vertex algebras can be generated from a collection of local fields. And uh, if these local fields are closed under taking commutators, if the commutator is expressed in terms of derivatives of the same generating fields, we get like something that's closer to a Lie algebra, and that's called the Lie conformal algebra. So, as I mentioned, uh, Lie conformal algebras, main examples come from a fine Lie algebras and the, the Virasoro Lie algebra. And the relationship is that uh, sort of like how from a Lie algebra you can construct a universal enveloping associative algebra. Uh, so from the Lie conformal algebra by taking the generating fields, we can construct a vertex algebra, which is sort of like a universal enveloping vertex algebra of the Lie conformal algebra. And in this way, we get, for example, what are called the universal vertex algebras, the universal affine, the universal dirasoro. These are all examples of freely generated vertex algebras. Of course, they have interesting simple quotients, but uh, uh, in fact, so far, we can only compute the cohomology for the universal vertex algebras. So let's look at this part of the story. Uh, but for Lie algebras, of course, uh, we know that if we take the symmetric algebra of the Lie algebra, we get the Poisson algebra. And similarly here, if we take the symmetric algebra over a Lie conformal algebra, we get what's called the Poisson vertex algebra. And you know, the Poincare Birko bit theorem tells you that if you take uh, the universal developing algebra, the Lie algebra, uh, it has a filtration and uh, the associated gradient for this filtration is the Poisson algebra. That's exactly the symmetric algebra of the Lie algebra. There is a similar notion here. Uh, many of the important vertex algebras come with what they call good filtrations as defined by Heisch and Lee. And uh, when you take uh, the associated gradient of the vertex algebra, you get the Poisson vertex algebra. Okay, so that's the picture. Those are the three objects that uh, we're going to discuss in this talk. And uh, 
the cohomology theory of leak and formal algebras was actually defined more than 20 years ago by uh, Katz, Voronov, and myself. And uh, what I understood at the time already is that, yes, leak and formal algebras behave very much like Lie algebras. The main reason for that is because they are indeed Lie algebras in a different category, uh, what's called the pseudo tender category. And that uh, follows the ideas of Bailinson and Brinfeld, uh, this book, Cairo Algebras, uh, where they did the same thing for Cairo Algebras, which are like a more geometric version of vertex algebras that can live on an arbitrary uh, algebraic curve. Like uh, in the case of uh, the complex line, uh, when you take uh, translation and variant uh, D modules, you get vertex algebras. So vertex algebras can be understood also as Lie algebras for a pseudo tensor category. And uh, then we realized that for some vertex algebras can also be understood in this way. And so uh, then you can develop the cohomology theory just like uh, usual for Lie algebras. You have a Chevrolet Eilenberg complex. So let me show you now some of the papers. I will share my screen and quickly just show you some papers that uh, I mentioned. So this is our main paper where, uh, okay, so I'll talk about operats in a minute, uh, but I hope many of you are familiar with operats. Uh, the way we express this whole picture of this di three different kinds of algebras is in terms of operats. Now, this is the paper where we started with Likum formal algebras. And here we computed the cohomology for the main examples, namely a fine Likum formal algebra and the Virasoro Likum formal algebra. Now, this is based on my PhD thesis, actually, where we developed a generalization of Likum formal algebras called Lie pseudo algebras, which are Lie algebras in the pseudo tensor category just like Bellinson and Greenfield. And uh, let me show you just some diagrams. What is a pseudo tensor category? Well, you all know what is a tensor category. It's like with vector spaces, you have tensor products and then a bilinear map, for example, from uh, one space, uh, two spaces to a third is the same as a linear map from the tensor product to the third space. But in a pseudo tensor category, you don't have a tensor product necessarily. You have the notions of n linear maps for every n. So you have maps that you can represent like this, pictorially. And then uh, you can compose such maps by plugging uh, the outputs of the maps as inputs of another map. And uh, they should satisfy a sensitivity. But uh, this is considered to be a symmetric category. So we also assume that the symmetric group SN uh, acts on the space of such n linear maps by permuting the inputs. Once we have this notion, we can talk about what the Lie algebra is. The Lie algebra is just an object that comes with a bilinear map from itself to itself, which is Q symmetric and satisfies the Jacobi identity. The Jacobi identity can be expressed in terms of compositions. So here is the skew symmetry pictorially, and then here is the Jacobi identity pictorially. Because if you're bracketing two elements and then bracket with the third, it's like composing this bracket map with itself this way, or you can compose it that way. And of course, you can also talk about the soft if you only have this equal to that, but then in a Lie algebra, you have a third term in the Jacobi identity, which is obtained from this one by applying the transposition one, two. If you can do that again, because you have an action of the symmetric group S3 on the space of such three linear maps. So the notion of a Lie algebra makes perfect sense. And uh, more generally, you can talk about modules. If you just put here a module instead of the algebra, 
And you can define the cohomology theory, uh, just as usual for Lie algebras, uh, as the Chevrolet Eilenberg complex. Uh, so it was on the previous page. So you just have to consider n linear maps from your Lie algebra to the module that there's Q symmetric. So if you Let's say if you transpose two consecutive in, uh, inputs, you get the negative sign. And then uh, the differential is uh, the usual Chevrolet Eilenberg differential. If you rewrite this, so these are expressed as compositions of these maps. Gamma is your cochain, and rho is the action of the Lie algebra of the model. And, uh, those are just compositions of maps, but of course, if you have a usually algebra, you apply this to elements, you will get the usual formulas for the Chevrolet Island equation. Any questions so far? So now let me uh, quickly explain something about operands. What's an operas? An opera P, uh, which I'll consider to be linear symmetric, uh, because it's linear as a collection of vector spaces. For all non negative integers n, or maybe positive. And uh, symmetric means that. Each PN comes equipped with the right action of the symmetric group SN. And uh, again, we should think of PN as uh, representing energy operations. But in this case, it's just from one object to itself. So if you have a pseudo tensor category and you restrict just to a single object and you look at the collections of all n linear maps from this object to itself, you get precisely the notion of an opera. So the compositions in an opera look like this. They're linear, so I'm going to write standard product. So here, if we have an element F, which is like an n linear map, and we have G1 is m1 linear, G2 is m2 linear, and so on, G m is m sub n linear. And then the composition is obtained just by plugging those elements inside that. And the result is going to be an operation with M1 plus M2 and so on, M sub N inputs. So this is a composition. All right. I hope you've seen this before. Um, so I'm not going to write the associativity of such compositions and so on, uh, but uh, they're all very natural. Of course, everything should be equivariant with respect to the actions of the symmetric groups and so on. Uh, now, operats are also expressed uh, in terms of circle I products. If you have just like usual maps between objects, then the circle represents the composition of maps. Well, here we can do compositions in many different ways. We can do F circle I G to be composing F with G, where we place G in the I spot and everything else we put the identity map. And it's clear that the more general compositions can be obtained from uh, just circle I products uh, just by plugging first G1 in the first spot, then G2 in the second spot, and so on. So that's another equivalent way to express compositions in an opera. Uh, so sometimes you may see them in terms of the circle I products. 
उसका सब एग्जाम्प हो फर्स्ट लेट्स वेक्टर स्पेस भी then we define what's called the endomorphism of recipe uh, we are also going to call it com operator think more often people use end but we call it com for some reason uh, and so com what are the energy operations here well these are indeed just the end linear maps from b to b And linear maps from B to B, or linear maps from the nth tensor power of B to B, because here we have a tensor product. And then uh, it's clear that all these compositions are usual just by plugging one map into another. And uh, indeed, the, the action of the symmetric group here is by permuting the inputs. Second example, I'll define what is known as the Lie operat. Uh, this operat, uh, yeah, I forgot to say, but every operat, I assume that uh, uh, in uh, P1, in uh, degree one uh, unary operations, I always have the identity map. So, yeah, I'm not going to. Is the right that Lee one is the identity, and then Lee two is one dimensional generated by a single element beta, which sort of represents the Lee bracket. The action of the symmetric group is such that if I act with the transposition one two, uh, then I get negative beta, and this amounts to the skew symmetry of the bracket. And so I assume that uh, this uh, beta satisfies the relation. There is a single relation that you need to impose, which is exactly what I showed you earlier uh, in terms of pictures, in terms of compositions. It means that uh, beta, You could also write this in terms of the circle product. Circle one, circle two, and then I need to transpose one and two. And again, if you think of better as representing a leap bracket. You can rewrite these formulas and they will give you exactly the skew symmetry for that and the Jacobian density for that. And now, the claim is that uh, an operat morphism. From the Lie operat to the com operat of the vector space B is equivalent to the Lie algebra structure on the vector space B. An operat morphism is a map that sends uh, emery operations to emery operations that's compatible with. The actions of the symmetric groups and with all compositions. And then it's clear that such a morphism is going to send beta to some bilinear map on D, which will be my Lie bracket on D. And then this condition means that it is Q symmetry. And then this identity satisfied by beta translates into the Jacobi identity for the bracket now on D as a bilinear map on D. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so the whole idea of our work, our starting point, is that we're going to replace this home opera with some more complicated generalized version of it. Uh, but then a morphism from the Lie opera to this generalized form opera is going to give us different algebraic structures on V that resemble Lie algebras. And we can do that to obtain Lie conformal algebras, uh, Poisson vertex algebras, and vertex algebras. So let me introduce the relevant operas now. Uh, so the third is what we're going to call the c -com opera. This is the conformal com. Okay. So this is the opera that replaces com for Lie conformal algebras. Uh, now I need to remind you that the Lie conformal algebra, uh, the idea again. Is not simply a vector space, but it's a module of polynomials in one variable. It comes equipped with a distinguished linear operator on it, which plays the role of the translation operator. For the vertex algebra, that's the translation operator in the vertex algebra, or L negative one of zero solo, if you have the vertex operator out. Okay. So this is a CFD module. I'll just call this D, the partial of delta. So V is now assumed to be CFD module. And then this space of uh, maps is going to consist of maps uh, that look like this. They're going to send, uh, again, they will act on n vectors from V, but the result is not going to be in V anymore. But it will be in polynomials with coefficients in the in n variables, so lambda one to lambda n. That's because the Lie conformal algebra has a, a Lie bracket that depends on a variable lambda. And then uh, we actually quotient by the image of d plus the sum of the lambda. So C form and consists of linear maps like that, subject to the condition, not all of such maps, but maps such that if I act with D on the I, so here V is in D to the power N, and I'm acting on the I factor with D. Then I will get minus lambda i. And uh, okay, I don't have time to uh, show you the, uh, the compositions, they're more complicated. If there is a question, I can show you all the formulas. But uh, yes, there are certain compositions that can be defined here. Uh, the action of the symmetric group is easier to explain because the symmetric group again permits the inputs here, but also simultaneously permits the variables lambda one through lambda. So it's sort of like every factor here in B to the N comes attached with its own variable, its own variable. And you can see it here also when D is acting on the I, I factor, you get minus on that. And then the claim is that for this opera, an opera morphism from the Lie opera to CCOM is equivalent to a Lie conformal algebra structure on this. 
And the precise formula is that the bracket beta here is sent to some element X, which is in CCOM 2, it's a binary operation. And then uh, it is related to the lambda bracket in the Lincoln formula algebra as follows. If you just uh, take your X with the variable lambda and minus lambda minus D, which by the way is always true because we're cautioning by the sum of D plus the sum of the lambdas. So if the first is lambda, then the second is minus lambda minus D. Then this is just the lambda bracket in the Lincoln formal algebra. And then uh, I can remind you quickly uh, the definition of a Lincoln formal algebra is that, okay, we have such a lambda bracket, which is a polynomial in lambda, and it satisfies various identities. One, for example, is what's called sesquilinearity. linearity that if you take DA lambda B is minus lambda A lambda B. And that corresponds exactly to the condition I had earlier, which I wrote the phase of DI is minus lambda I. And then the other says linearity is uh, this D plus lambda. Which uh, again, if you think of this variable as lambda one and this one as lambda two, that's the same property for lambda two. And then there is also the skew symmetry in the Lincoln formal algebra, which here doesn't look very symmetric somehow. It's minus lambda minus dA. But uh, if you look in terms of lambda one and lambda two, it's just switching them. Because if lambda is lambda one, lambda two is minus lambda minus two. So when you think of it this way, it becomes more natural, more symmetric. Okay. And then, as I said, one can develop the call theory of the homology of liquid formal algebras and so on, but that's kind of the older story. And now let me show you how to extend that in order to capture vertex algebra. So I'm going to define what we call now the Cairo operator. You know, to P Cairo, PCH. And again, the starting point is from P of D module B, which is fixed. And then uh, P Cairo of N, the N, the Anaric Cairo operations are going to look similarly to what we have here for the conformal operations, but we want to localize sort of. Uh, uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to allow here a rational function. So let me explain what this is. So, so the input is going to be n vectors, but also some function. What, what is this O n star P? It's actually just all polynomials, Laurent polynomials in Pi minus Dj, no possible differences. 
So the star is because we're localizing and here is for translation for area, which means they depend only on the differences. And uh, okay, now this condition here, of course, needs to be replaced with something else. We actually need to impose two conditions now on such maps. Uh, and this one is replaced with the following. If you take X and you add to it Gi plus lambda I on a vector B, so here you also need to send them with a function F. So here B is in V to the N. F is a superaction function. Then this should be the same as X with B standard uh, with uh, DZI. Derivative of F with respect to the I. And uh, if you apply this to the constant function f equals one, it becomes exactly the previous condition we had on conformal linear maps. So the conformal apparatus actually the CCOM sits inside this one if we just put here the constant function one. And there is another condition that we need to impose. And what happens if we multiply function by di minus dj, then this turns into derivative with respect to lambda j minus derivative with respect to lambda. So again, the p chiral of n consists of all linear maps x like that that satisfy uh, this two condition. And we call that the space of energy chiral operations. Uh, the symmetric group SN acts on it by permuting the inputs here, permuting the variables Z1 through Zn, and the lambda 1 through lambda simultaneously. And then the compositions, of course, are more complicated than the other compositions. So again, I'll leave that I'll leave there in the question. But one can define explicitly compositions, and this is indeed the symmetric operand. Then the result is that uh, the morphism of operands from the Lie operands to the Cairo operands of C is equivalent to a non unital, which means without a vacuum. There's nothing about the vacuum here. Non unital vertex algebra structure on the uh, What is the explicit formula? Again, this is actually quite explicit. The bracket operation, beta, corresponds to some. Uh, binary chiral operation x. So x, remember, depends on two lambdas, but their sum plus d is zero. So again, they're lambda and minus lambda minus d. It depends on two vectors, a and b, and then to solve them. And on the function f, where f is uh, translation covariant function in two variables. So it's actually just a, uh, some uh, Laurent polynomial in Z1 minus Z2. So let's say this is Z2 minus Z1. There is some change in sign. So I'm writing it as Z2 minus Z1 to the power n. And then the explicit formula is that uh, This is going to be the sum over non-negative j lambda to the power j over j factorial times a n plus j, where this represents the f products in your vertex algebra. 
And notice that if n is equal to zero, if we did here we put the constant function one, this is going to be exactly the lambda bracket. The lambda bracket is defined as the generated function of the non-negative j product. But if we allow negative values of n, we can also capture the negative products, in particular for n equals minus one. If you just set lambda equals zero, you get the minus first product, which corresponds to the normal order product. Okay, questions about that? Okay, and then again, one can actually develop define the cohomology theory of vertex algebras and uh, uh, let me just say again uh, we have very explicit formulas but I don't want to write them uh, I can show them in the papers but this cohomology in particular behaves very much like Lie algebra cohomology uh, in low degree it captures all the necessary things that it should capture uh, so the zero cohomology gives you the space of Casimir's, the first cohomology uh, gives you the space of derivations, modulo inner derivations, and uh, then second cohomology with coefficients in the module uh, gives you uh, extensions of your vertex algebra, a billion extensions where the module is built at a billion. In particular, uh, if you take the adjoint representation, you get first order deformations of the second cohomology. Yeah, I should mention also that there are other cohomology theories of vertex algebras. One was proposed by Borchers uh, in the paper where he claimed that vertex algebras are trivial because they're commutative and sensitive rings in some very complicated category. And then uh, he said, well, let's just do Hochschild and Harrison cohomology. Uh, you know, there is a Harrison cohomology community in associative algebras, there is Hochschild cohomology for associative algebras. Uh, this was developed more explicitly by Yuji Huang, where he did Hochschild cohomology of vertex algebras. So that's very different from what we do here, because what we're doing is more like Lie algebra cohomology or Chevalier Einenberg, not Hochschild. Uh, and you can see this difference already in the first cohomology. Because in Huang's approach, the first cohomology is the space of all derivations, not quotient by inner derivations. But in fact, uh, some time ago, I remember there was a talk at the conference where someone was speaking about that, and uh, he said, well, it's actually good to quotient by inner derivations. Well, we get that in our approach. Okay, but now I want to talk about the third object, the Poisson vertex algebra. So for that, we need the filtration of the vertex algebra. And uh, yeah, I guess, uh, again, I'll just give it a broad kind of picture. Uh, the idea is that uh, if uh, B is now a vertex algebra, with a good filtration, I'll attach it to uh, What it means, uh, actually, what this means is that uh, if you take uh, if you take the normally ordered product, uh, it has degree zero with respect to the filtration. And if you take the lambda bracket, which uh, really represents all the non-negative products in the vertex algebra. You get uh, something of degree, they're all of degree minus one. Then we define the associated gradients, which I will denote by script V. Uh, 
Okay, I'm assuming this situation is not negative. You can just set down that uh, this is, of course, the statement that P and E. Uh, and then uh, the claim is that this is going to be a Poisson vertex algebra. I think Kai Shankly already knew that. So, what happens is that uh, the lambda bracket gets induced on the associated gradients. It becomes a lambda bracket there. So, you still get the Lee conformal algebra structure. You still have a, Lee, a lambda bracket. Uh, the normal product gets induced in the associated gradient and becomes now commutative and associative, and they are related by the Leibniz rule. So, this is just like the usual Poisson algebra, except that the Poisson bracket is the lambda bracket. Now, let's see what we can do in addition to that. Is we can also introduce a filtration on the space of rational functions. Um, and uh, we do that by just counting the number of poles. And uh, when you do this, it induces a filtration on the Cairo operator. So the Cairo operator itself becomes filtered. So, so we have an increase in filtration. On the space of rational function, where you just count. This is just O and star O and T is just polynomials in the other. The polynomials without poles, and then F1 is going to be functions with one pole, and so on. But actually, this will terminate anyway. I can't go into all the details, but then this induces a decreasing filtration on the chiral opera. So the apparatus itself becomes filtered so that all the compositions and actions of the symmetric group are compatible with the filtration. And we can take its associated gradient apparatus. And uh, in this way, you get almost something else which we define independently and uh, under various conditions, in fact, becomes isomorphic to it. And this is what we call, so under some conditions, on the filtration. And this is what we call now the Clark cooperative. So now let me introduce this path to us. So again, it is constructed from a CFD module. Although there is a simpler version of it that actually is independent of lambda. So. Uh, the space of energy classical operations, E classical N, is going to consist of maps, which again depends on N vectors. But then instead of a rational function in the, in the variables, it also depends on the graph 
with ten verses. So these are graphs. And then they are mapped again to the same thing. B polynomials in n variables are the ones we found there, and questions are the same thing as before. And now this needs to satisfy some conditions. One is that if the graph has a cycle, you actually get zero. So you only get acyclic graphs. Then there is a cycle relation that if you have a cycle and you delete one edge from it consecutively and you add all of these things, you should get zero. And uh, so on, various conditions like that. But what happens is that, again, this extends the CCOM operand. Because it turns out that if you only took the graphs with n vertices and no edges, this gives you exactly the CCOM that we talked about earlier. And then it turns out that morphism from the Lie operat to this classical operat is equivalent to a for some vertex algebra structure only. And uh, the Lie bracket again will give you some binary operation X. But uh, because it is uh, the class cooperative, it depends on the graph. And uh, here's what happens if I take the graph just with two vertices and no edges. As before, this gives me the lambda bracket. And if I take the graph just with the single edge, yeah, I should say these are actually oriented edges. And then it's actually independent of the lambda. And this gives me exactly the commutative associative product in my Poisson vertex algebra. And then again, you can introduce the cohomology theory and so on, and you get so called classical cohomology of the Poisson vertex algebra. However, for Poisson vertex algebra, there is also a different cohomology theory known as the variational cohomology. And this was used extensively by Alberto de Sole and Victor Katz in uh, developing the theory of bicamiltonian systems. So, the whole theory of Poisson vertex algebra is very useful there for bicamiltonian systems. And in particular, the so called variational cohomology. What's the variational cohomology? It's just like the Lee conformal algebra cohomology, but you only take uh, called chains that satisfy the Leibniz rule with respect to each variable, with respect to each input. And uh, the variational cohomology, in fact, sits inside here again when you take only the graphs without edges. And so one theorem that we proved is that uh, again under some assumptions basically assuring that you have the universal Poisson vertex algebra assuming that the Poisson vertex algebra as a commutative associative algebra is an algebra of differential polynomials in finitely many variables then we prove that the variation of Poisson cohomology is isomorphic to the classical cohomology and maybe I'll just say this thing without writing the running out of time. So that's one result. And then the next result is how do you tie this up with vertex algebras? Well, as I showed you, when you have a vertex algebra with a good filtration, it's associated graded with a Poisson vertex algebra. So the Poisson vertex algebra is a semi classical limit of the vertex algebra. But that holds for the cohomology as well. And to make it more precise, what we did was we defined the filtration on the co-chain complex of the vertex algebra, as I showed you earlier, because the chiral operator itself has a filtration. But every time you have 
a filtered uh, complex, you get a spectral sequence. And so we have a spectral sequence because first term is the classical homology of the PVA, the associated gradient of the vertex algebra. And the spectral sequence converges to the cosmology of the vertex algebra. Again, under some assumptions. And so in particular, we get upper bounds because in the spectral sequence, the dimensions can only decrease because every time you take a sub quotient, you take the cosmology to get the next page, you take cosmology again. So every time you're taking a sub quotient, you can only decrease the dimension. So we get an upper bound on the dimension of the cohomology of the vertex algebra in terms of the cohomology of the Poisson vertex algebra, the classical one. But then it's isomorphic to the variational. And then the variational cohomology we were able to compute in the cases of the main examples. Uh, and we actually showed it's really just generated by the Lee conformal algebra cohomology, which was found earlier. And so we, we can do that in the case of universal fine, uh, universal Virasoro, three bosons and three fermions. So these are the examples in which we can compute the homology just by going first to the Poisson vertex algebra and then from there to the Lee conformal algebra. All right, uh, thank you for the attention. Uh, and I can elaborate if there are questions I can show some formula. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me uh, stop the recording and we'll move on to questions. Thank you.